Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Tina kind of oversold me, but hopefully not too much, because I believe that what I teach is uh, very important. This is my battle cry these days. Failure bites, bite back. I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I kind of got my butt kicked a few times. And uh, uh, the last time I decided I don't want this to ever happen again to me or anyone else. So my mission is to help entrepreneurs, most of you here, to teach you how to fight failure and win consistently. But first, let me tell you, uh, I'm going to structure it very simply, seven strategies in 35 minutes. I don't have a lot of time, but fortunately, there is a book that you can buy out there that you, know, you can spend six hours in my uh, company. And I was told, give, you, give the advice you would give to your 20-year-old self. So a lot of 20-year-old here. But regardless, this advice is timeless. So that whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, this entrepreneurial advice uh, is uh, applicable. Now, my entrepreneurial journey. As you can tell from my accent, I was not born here. I was born in Italy. And uh, like pizza, I decided to come from Italy to America for bigger <laughs> and, uh, and better things. And of course, what do you do? So I landed in Silicon Valley. I decided I want to join a startup. And I joined in 1985 a little startup called Sun Microsystems, pre-IPO. Pre, pre and uh, some of you are too young. You don't even know about this company. But it used to be kind of the, like the Google uh, of those days. And I had a very good uh, run there for about 13, 13 years. I was in engineering at, the, at first, and then I ended, running, ended up running a research group. And the stock went great. And so I thought, wow, this is so cool. You know, startups are great. This is awesome. I want to do my own startup. So I left Sun, and I started my, my first company. We raised $3 million in VC funding. And 18 months later, we received an offer for acquisition for $100 million. Do you think we accepted that offer? How many think you we accepted? No, but are you a fool? Yeah, of course we accepted it. <laughs> you accepted it. You know, this was 2001. That's like a billion today. Don't be an idiot. Take it, <laughs> right? Uh, take it. So it worked out very well. And I thought, wow, you know, this is easy. So I, I thought, well, I called my friends in Italy. Hey, Mario, come to America. It's good. You know, <laughs> this is. Um, and so I spent a year at the acquiring company. Uh, and then I joined another little startup pre pre ipo called Google as uh, the first engineering director. And uh, you know, among other things, I led the ads team. And we all know how well Google did. So I thought, you know, this is really easy. And I'm kind of good at picking startups. So if I raise $3 million and exited with a $100 million offer, if I raise $30 million, I'm going to exit at $1 billion. You know, the math doesn't really work like that. But you know, in, in my mind, that sounded good. So my, sec my second startup, which I funded, where it's $25 million from the best VCs in the Valley, uh, we developed this tool that people told us, if you can build the software development tools, everybody will flock to your doors. Please build it, uh, and we will buy it. So we built the tool, spent two years to build a very sophisticated uh, product. Every, we won every possible awards for technology. It was an amazing tool. So I thought, wow, I'm really good at this. You know, I'm, I may be the Italian Steve Jobs. Stefano, <laughs> Stefano Giobini. You know, I thought, that sounds good. It has a ring to it. Except that five years later, bang, we, we know, we had a fire sale. All those people that told us, if you build it, we will buy, somehow disappeared, even though we built exactly what they said we were going to build. So this time, my reaction was a little different. And I created this acronym that stands for why the failure, right? <laughs> so I, I asked myself, why did, we, uh, why did we fail? And I decided, OK, I want to study failure. So I went back to Google as engineering director, but also as innovation agitator to try to shake new, uh, new ideas out of Google. And you cannot innovate without fail failing. So I became, from an engineer, I became an innovation agitator. And I always wanted a PhD, and I didn't get it, but I got an FD. I'm a doctor of philosophy, the only one in the world. I don't know if anybody in the planet has studied failure more than I did. And I'm here to share with you some of uh, these ideas. So I only have time to give you seven strategies. I started with 10, and then I timed it, and I couldn't do it. So I decided, Alberto, you're going to talk fast, and you're only going to give them seven strategies. First one, obey the law of market failure. The law comes in two parts. The first one is pretty depressing. Most new ideas will fail in the market. The second one gets even more depressing, even if competently executed. 
Now, if you've been around the block, you know that's true. Most new ideas, most new companies, most new products from existing companies will fail in the market, right? The data is, you, know, you, you cannot fight against it. But what about the second part? What does it mean that they fail even if competently executed? It means that even if you're at Google and you launch products that are squarely and what Google is good at, the law of market failure applies to you. If you search for Google failure, one of the pages you'll come up with is called the Google Graveyard, apparently put together by a Microsoft product manager who was kind of upset at Google at the time. And, but it illustrates that even large companies fail a lot. I asked my students, take a piece of paper, write all the Google products you know of, and then I show them the list of the failures that I know of, and the ratio is usually five or 10 to one. By the way, the, the Google, uh, Google didn't like what Microsoft did to us, so we created the Microsoft Morgue, <laughs> which has even more failed products, right? So this is pretty much par for the course. You know, the, the law of failure applies to everybody. But then I started to say, okay, law of failure is true. I'm gonna obey, but why do most new ideas fail uh, in the market? So I, I did my research to look at thousands of failure, and basically I put them into three major buckets. Uh, with a convenient acronym FLOP, failure due to launch, operation, or premise. Failure due to launch means that the market doesn't know about your idea or cannot reach your idea. So essentially, kind of a failure of marketing. People don't know about it. Failure due to operation means the product doesn't work, right? The app crashes or maybe it's a restaurant and the food sucks. Failure due to premise means that even if you market it well, even if it works well, people simply do not care about your new product idea. Which one do you think is the most common source of failure? Well, I'll hold the suspense. It's the last one. Most new ideas fail because the market simply does not care. And as we'll see, even if they tell you, yes, yes, build it, we will buy it, that's not the case. Most new ideas fail because they are not what I call the right it, which happens to be the title of my new book. What is the right it? Well, I'll explain it in a second. But first, the second important strategy, make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. Because all of my research, and anybody that's been around will confirm it, companies do not fail because they really cannot build what they set out to build. I mean, it happens, but it's rare. Most of the time you fail because you built the wrong product. So the right it, I define it as follows. It's an idea that if competently executed, will succeed in the market. And it has an evil twin, the wrong it an idea that even if competently executed will fail in the market. That means that if your idea is bad, doesn't matter how much marketing fireworks or engineering brilliance you put into it, it will fail in the market. Let me give you some examples of the right it and the wrong it. Big Mac for McDonald's, the right it. Uh, other Arch Deluxe or the Mac Hula, a burger with a slice of pineapple in the middle, not the right it, right? Uh, Coca-Cola, they write it. New Coke, after millions of dollars in research and launch and advertising, failed. Not the right it. Everybody here has probably seen the movie Star Wars. How many saw the movie Howard the Duck? <laughs> Not a lot, yeah, there's just a few. And you know what those two movies have in common? Steven Spielberg. Howard the Duck, believe it or not, is a movie that Steven Spielberg decided to do after Star Wars. And it had 10 times the budget, and on top of it, it had ducks. And everybody loves duck, right? Donald Duck, Duffy Duck, Duck all orange, ducks are cool. And yet, <laughs> it failed miserably. Uh, Gmail, how many people here have Gmail account? Good. How many people here had a Google Wave account? Just fewer hands. Yes. Sir, how many Google Waves did you write? None. None, right. So you should, actually, you're better than most people said two. Right, so Google Wave was supposed to be the follow-up to email, a new paradigm, lots of marketing developed by the same people that did Google Maps, great team, and yet it failed. And yet you see it has the same Google Color, the same Google Great Engineer, the free massager, the free lunches, all the Google benefits, and yet it failed. Uh, Ford Mustang success, Ford Edsel, not so much. Right, so all of this, what, all of this example, what they have in common is that these are companies that are successful with other products, and they're launching products that are exactly what they do, like, Cars, uh, you know, electronic things, movies, and yet they fail, because you cannot fight the law of failure. If you take competent execution plus an idea that is the wrong it, you're guaranteed failure 100% of the time. The law of failure is blind. So you don't want to bring out an idea that is the wrong it, and you ask yourself, well, how do I know if I'm an idea is the right it? Well, do not ask. And what I mean by that is that if all you have is an idea, 
and you tell other people your idea, the most you can get back are questions, and this is a very dangerous thing to do. Why? Because ideas live in a place I call Thoughtland. So in Thoughtland, you have an idea. Hey, here's my brilliant idea. You tell it to other people, and what do you get back? Just a bunch of opinions. Whoops, I overclicked. A bunch of opinions. And opinions are subjective, they are biased. You know, you filter them through your own preferences and beliefs. I, for example, I thought that Uber was a terrible idea. Strangers picking up strangers from strange places and driving them to spend the night at a stranger's house on the couch. That's another startup idea, Airbnb, which I thought was terrible, right? So you need to filter uh, these ideas. Two horrible things happen in Thoughtland. The first one is, if you have an idea, uh, and people think it's the greatest thing ever. One of my favorite examples is the Segway Transporter. You know, those little scooters that you used to see a few years ago. When this was about to be launched, everybody talked about it, right? Everybody thought, best idea ever. It was in the cover of magazines that had some of the best VCs in the Valley. Architects said, cities will be redesigned, so everybody's going around in a scooter, right? So, and then they launched it, and who do you see riding Segways? Mall cops and lazy tourists. That's about it, right? So, uh, and clearly, it's not because a failure due to marketing. People knew about it. In fact, it was talked all over. It's not a failure due to operation because it worked well. I don't know why things fail, right? I just know that most of them fail. So, and these are called an example of a false positive. People tell you, best idea ever, you launch it, and it fails. How common are false positive? The most common thing that people launch. So, everything in the Google graveyard, in the uh, Microsoft morgue, in the Amazon ambulance, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are ideas that at some point people thought, best ideas ever, and then they launched it, and it failed. Why? Because you know what doesn't fail? The law of market failure, right? Most new ideas will fail even in market if competently executed. So first bad thing that happens, people give you the thumbs up, you spend a lot of money, you launch the idea, it fails miserably. The opposite can happen. You have an idea, and people think it's the worst idea ever. Honestly, I felt that way about Twitter the first time I heard about it. What, 140 characters, people can follow, everyone can follow anyone, sounds terrible. And yet, for better or worse, we know that Twitter has changed the way that we you know, converse as a, a species. So this is an example of a false negative. People tell you it's a terrible idea, and then it succeeds. So here's your dilemma, right? If all you have is an idea, you cannot depend on people's opinion. You cannot just ask them, would you want it? Would you buy? What would you do with it? So what can you depend on? Any ideas? <coughs> okay, well, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll jump ahead because we don't have a lot of time. You depend on data. And as you can see, you trust, not opinion, trust data. And not just any data, your own data. Because right? when I tell people, you know, you need data beats opinion and you need to collect your data, People think, uh, okay, yeah, well, this looks like data. I mean, it's in a spreadsheet, so it must be data. No, right? There's two types of data, OPD and Yoda. OPD stands for other people's data. Can you guess what Yoda stands for? Well, you, you guys are smart, okay, you're great. <laughs> yes, you're on data. And these two are as different in my book, literally, as apples and oranges, in fact, rotten apples and fresh oranges. OPD is the worst possible thing you can collect, right? So OPD is market data collected by other people at other time for other products, with other methods, with other filters, et cetera, et cetera. It may or may not apply to you, and most of the time it does not apply to you. It's dangerous because just because other ideas similar to yours have failed doesn't mean that yours will fail. Imagine if Elon Musk, thinking of Tesla, thought, well, let me see how other car companies did with electric cars. Uh, you know, zero of them succeed. I said, well, okay, forget this Tesla thing. I'm gonna go and do something else, right? So just because other companies fail with an idea doesn't mean that you will fail. The opposite is true. Just because others have succeeded in the past with your idea doesn't mean that yours will succeed. Apple succeeded with the iPhone. Google succeeded with Android and Samsung. Uh, did Amazon succeed with the Fire Phone? No, right? So OPD is very dangerous. So I urge all my entrepreneurs to collect your own market data. First hand, fresh, local, recent, recently collected, and most importantly, your data needs to have skin in the game. What do I mean by skin in the game? If I ask you, what do you think of my idea? And you tell me, oh, Albert, it's good. I said, should I leave my job to pursue it? I say, sure, go, go for it. Right? You have nothing at risk. Skin in the game means that as an entrepreneur, 
you're putting, you're risking, right? You're risking your time, your reputation, your money to go and start a new venture. You're putting your own skin in the game. You want to get skin in the game back from the market, right? And skin in the game can be the market's time, money, commitment, information, reputation, something of value and at risk. Let me give you a very simple example. Uh, Susie came up with a great idea, a smart hammer, so you, you hit the nail instead of hitting your fingers. She goes and asks people, hey, you know, I'm thinking of this hammer, Do, would you buy it? And some people said, yes, good idea, other people say, bad idea. Does this count as data? No, right, this is opinions. Now, in another scenario, she, she says, well, I'm planning to build this hammer, and if you give me $50 deposit, I will make sure that you get one of the first one. So some people say it's a lame idea, they're dead to me, you know, just like in Shark Tank, <laughs> you're dead to me. But uh, the other people say, instead of saying it's a good idea, if they actually open their wallet and give you some money, you have the first indication that the market really is interested in your idea, right? You fix an asymmetry. Before you put in your skin in the game by quitting your job or getting VC funding, get some from the market. Uh, so that's a, what we call Yoda. You can quote me on this, it's much easier to get people to open their mouth than to open their wallet. The hardest thing an entrepreneur can do is to get companies and people to open their wallet. I've been told so many times, Alberto, it's a fantastic idea, go build it, and then when I went to sell it to them, I said, well, yeah, not to not, we're having a bad quarter, forget about it, right? So it, it's very uh, important. You need to change the way you approach market research from this traditional model of doing market surveys or asking people this question. If we build it, will you buy it? Which is how most market research is done, by the way, right? You, you ask these questionnaires, you flip it around completely, 180 degrees. Think about this. If you buy it, we will build it. Now, this seems very counterintuitive, but I will give you an example of how exactly how to do it. Uh, because now you're asking, well, don't I have to have a product built before I can see if people want to buy? And the answer is no. You don't build it, you pretotype it. This is not a typo. This is a word I invented, pretotype it, because it had to be invented. So uh, strategy number five is pretotype it. What is a pretotype? Well, it's the simplest artifact or technique you can use to collect Yoda very quickly and very inexpensively. So th there is a big range bet between having an idea and the final product. This could be years, months, you know, uh, millions of dollars. And the way I see it, pretotype come very, very early. A pretotype is something that you can build in minutes, hours, maybe a couple of days, and it should cost anywhere from zero to maybe a couple of hundred bucks if you really feel like splurging, right? A prototype is something that actually works, can do something, and can take a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. I've worked on prototypes for uh, software development tools that took a year and a half just to prove that the thing would actually work. And of course, the products take a long time. So prototypes are things that you can build very, very quickly, literally, in a couple of hours. And let me give you an example of pretotyping, uh, something that actually got my thinking about this process. About 30, 40 years ago, IBM wanted to, everybody to have personal computers. But you know, 40 years ago, most people didn't know how to type, right? Those of us that were around there, you remember, this is how people type. So they figured, no way that people can use computers if they have to learn how to type. Who types? Uh, programmers, writers, and uh, secretaries, right? Nobody else knows how to type. Nobody wants to take typing lessons. But they wanted to know, well, if we solve this problem of speech to text, right, so you can just speak to a computer, will people actually buy our product? So they did something very clever, an experiment. They brought people in the room, they gave them a, mi a microphone, a monitor, no keyboard, and told them, look, speaking to this computer, we have a prototype of speech to text. Uh, and people spoke into it, and magically the computer did whatever. Uh, people told them to do. Of course, this was not possible. Those days, even the fastest computer couldn't handle this. So what was happening? Well, in a room next door, one of those amazing people that can tap as fast as you can talk uh, was actually transcribing everything that uh, was being heard through the computer. And I tell you, as an engineer, this example kind of really messed up with my mind. Because if you go in, how many engineers here? I mean, you know, they use soldering iron, et cetera. So if you come to an engineer and say, Alberto, we need to build a prototype, I said, great, fire up the compiler or the soldering iron, right? I thought, this is not a prototype. They're just pretending that they have something to work. So in fact, I created this first word, pretendotype. <laughs> so, 
Because I knew this is not a prototype. It's not like IBM was planning to breed a, a race of small typists that they fit inside boxes, <laughs> and you feed them cheese and crackers through the floppy drive, right? So it's not a prototype. It's something completely different from the end product. And then I shrunk the word to prototype because it's easier uh, to pronounce. But remember, prototype means before a prototype, but also use your imagination uh, to pretend. So what IBM learned is that before the prototype test, a lot of people thought, of course, we want a speech-to-text computer. Now, if you try to actually use a speech-to-text computer all day without a keyboard, your throat gets sore, the room gets very loud, and you cannot dictate or work on confidential things like fire Bob. Oh, sorry, Bob, didn't know you were around here, <laughs> right? So in Thoughtland, speech-to-text was a sure winner when people actually tried it, realized it was not. So uh, this is an example of what I call a mechanical Turk prototype. You know, and these days everybody's talking about robotics and AI. Before you spend four years and $40 million to, to create some automated uh, pizza maker or something, uh, something else, you can use human beings to simulate that behavior. It doesn't scale, but you can learn if people would actually uh, use it. A prototype with a noise, something you usually typically build to figure out, can we build it? How long will the battery last? How will it work, et cetera, et cetera. It basically asks the question, how do we build it right? And here's the secret. Most of the time, you can build it. Now, if you tell me, I have an idea for a time machine, you know, I call the guys with the white coats and tell you, you probably cannot build it, but most of the ideas people have uh, are buildable. A prototype asks different questions. It asks you, should we build it? You know, will I use it? What will I use it for? In other words, prototype asks the idea, it asks, is this idea the right it? Something that if I build uh, competently will succeed in the market. Now, there are several prototyping techniques. This is a cheat sheet from a class that I had the honor of teaching uh, with Tina. Let me give you a, just a few more examples. The facade prototype, uh, Cars Direct wanted to know at the beginning of the internet, would people buy used cars online? So what did they do? Did they buy cars? Did they have a big, complicated website? No, they had a very simple website with just a few cars, no cars in inventory. They advertised it, and miraculously, the first two days, they sold four cars. So immediately, they shut down the website. They bought four cars at retail. They sold them at retail. So they lost a few hundred dollars on each car. But what did they gain? Yoda, right? Yoda. Nothing is more valuable than a check. right? A check tells you that people really want uh, your product. I'd rather have a one-page business plan, an outline with four checks stapled to it, than a 30-page highly detailed business plan with all kinds of charts. Another example of prototyping is this from IKEA. Uh, this team in San Francisco came up with a really simple product called the Wall Hub. It's a piece of plastic where you put your keys and your mail. Uh, they wanted to know, would people buy them? You know, should we have 10,000 built? So they had an idea. They thought, well, what, where would people buy this? IKEA. So they did something very clever. They went on eBay, they, they bought a used IKEA employee shirt so they could pretend, remember, pretend to type it, that they were an IKEA employee. Then they created a fake label for their product. Of course, they had to change it to an IKEA name, like Valhub. Uh, <laughs> and they put this label, and then instead of shoplifting, they entered an IKEA store and placed their product on some free shelf space. And then they watched to see if anybody would actually stop and buy it. And lo and behold, you can watch the video, I put uh, the link there. People actually took it, put it in their cart, and everything worked fine until they got to the cashier because uh, things got a little confusing. But would you agree that if I have two Val hoops in my cart, is that opinion? No. Is that other people's data? No. That's Yoda. That's the most valuable thing you can have. Uh, another example of prototyping called the impersonator. You can take an existing product, uh, put a wrapper around it, and very quickly, come up with a new idea, and then you can use that to collect data. My favorite example for this is what Elon Musk did with the original Tesla Roadster. He took a load of cellies, ripped off the, the gasoline engine, put an electric engine, and then went, you know, built his one-off model, and then gave people rides in this car. It's amazing. Zero to 60 in three seconds. So let's assume I gave you for a ride. Did you like it? Quickly, quickly. Did you like? Yes. Pretty, pretty fast and sexy. Okay, it's gonna cost $120,000 and you have to wait two years and you have to put, put a big charge in your garage. Uh, would you buy it? No. Yes. No. Yes. Okay, so two years and two no. So the, the no's are dead to me. Now, but the yes <laughs> have not given me any skin in the game. So what Elon Musk did, which was brilliant, to say, remember, if you buy it, I will build it. So I'm gonna ask you, well, you know, it's not that I don't trust you guys, but you know, if you give me a check for $5,000, I'll put you in the, in the list. You're number 31 and you're number 32. Now think, 
Is it easier to say a yes or to write a check for $5,000 to a guy that never built a car company before, right? And yet, a few hundred people did that, and to these days, you cannot buy a Tesla without putting a deposit. So if you think that my idea, if you buy it, we will build it, is crazy, Tesla is a perfect example of that uh, in action. You want to do this because you want to fail fast and cheap. People talk a lot about failing fast, but as you can tell from how fast I speak, that's not fast enough for me, right? I tell, tell them, I want you to fail Ferrari fast and Fiat cheap. Sorry, Fiat, <laughs> right? Uh, so, because remember, most new ideas will fail in the market, which means that you have to test a lot of ideas. And if you take six months to test an idea, uh, good luck, right? Unless your luck is going to take uh, forever. So, pre-totapping allows you to test very quickly. More importantly, you're not going to experience painful failure, right? Because you spend twenty dollars to do an to do a, a pre-totap test. It's an experiment, right? It doesn't hurt. Definitely doesn't hurt after uh, as much as spending three years and $25 million to build a product that, that, that people do not want. So uh, uh, strategy number six, say it with numbers. Entrepreneurs, and probably most of you, when you have an idea, you come to me and you, you express it very vaguely. So here's an idea from some of your fellow students maybe five, six years ago. Second day sushi. Here's the idea, right? Packaged sushi is kind of expensive. So they thought, you know what? Uh, if we buy sushi that's about to expire, right, it's only good for an extra eight hours before it kills you, we can buy for 25 cents on the dollars and sell it at 50 cents on the dollars, and since students are young and have a strong stomach, we can handle it. So I said, okay, I'm not going to give you my opinion on your idea, but, uh, 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 but I'm asking them, so this is how they articulated, right? Uh, people, lots of them will buy not super fresh sushi if it's cheap enough. That's pretty much how they express. I said, look, who are these people? how many is lost, and what is cheap enough. So I, I was in a room actually outside there, you know, just outside this auditorium, and somebody had left a formula, you know, calculus class or uh, electrical engineering class on the, on the wall, and I thought, okay, tell you what, write it like this, X percent of Y will Z. I call this the XYZ hypothesis, right? So it forces you to write your idea in numbers. So in this case, they translate it into number, 20% of packaged sushi buyers will buy second day sushi if it's half the price of fresher sushi. How do you know if those numbers are right? You don't. It's a hypothesis, right? But at least it articulates and puts into number what your ideas are. And what is the job of an hypothesis? A, a hypothesis exists to be tested, and pre-totapping our tool to test uh, hypothesis. Uh, last point, test, uh, think global, test local. Maybe the second day sushi team is planning to take over the market, right? Every supermarket is going to have second day sushi. But you need to start to test your ideas very quickly. You want to minimize these metrics that I explain in my book called time to data, dollars to data, distance to data. If people say, I have this great idea and I need six months, $2 million, and I need to fly to Hawaii to do my research, uh, I said, well, no, you're going to do it here, you're going to do it for $20, and I want the results by tomorrow, right? And a technique for doing that is called hypozooming. So you take this big hypothesis, 20% of packaged sushi buyers, and you zoom in. Uh, you, know, you know those documentaries where you see, or those videos where you see the Earth from space, and then it zooms into a, you know, to a town, and then to a particular uh, place, and then to a building? I want you to do that in your mind, right? So you take the big XYZ hypothesis and hypozoom to something you can test here and now. And when I say here and now, I mean it literally, here and now, right? So where are we now? North America, right? We're in North America, Silicon Valley. We're in Silicon Valley, Stanford University. We're in Stanford University, building Y2, E2. And then I ask you, is there a place in this building or nearby that sells sushi? Yeah. Yes, there is, upstairs, right? Coupa Cafe. So I said, great. So you're gonna hypo zoom. You can, you have your market, a small sample of your market is there. So you can go from the big XYZ hypothesis to the small XYZ hypothesis. 20% of students buying sushi at Coupa Cafe to their dinner will buy second day sushi, right? And do you believe that this is actually testable? Can I do this test? Absolutely, in fact, we did it. We even did a little video, right, with some of my friends there. Where, is, where are you guys? Yes, we did it here, we, we filmed it. We went, uh, we created little labels that said second day sushi, half off, and we slapped them on fresh sushi, right? It's an impersonator prototype. And then we tried to sell them. In fact, if you're there, that's outside the STVP offices. Now, uh, how many people do you think bought our second day sushi? Zero, right? 
right? Because you know, the typical thing is, well, you know, I don't want to get sick. So it do, doesn't mean that second day sushi has no chance. It just means that you need uh, to do some more tests. But it, frankly, you, your Yoda doesn't look uh, very good. Right, so these are just seven strategies. There is a lot more, but I cannot possibly talk any faster and our time uh, is limited. So there is more, yes, a lot more. There is a book, I see some of you already bought it. Thank you so much, if you haven't bought it, go to Amazon and buy it. No, no I'm not done, I'm not done, yes. Yes, it's, it's a great book, thank you. Uh, but uh, there is more. But because the question you have to ask is, hey Alberto, do you practice what you teach? Say, so you better do. Not because I don't wanna be a hypocrite, because what I teach works. All the techniques are right. I'm an engineer. I'm not in marketing, I'm not in sale. I'm an engineer. If it doesn't work, I wouldn't talk about it. Right, so pre-totapping techniques cannot not work. Any more than the quadratic formula cannot work. Right, you, you plug in the numbers unless you screw up, it does work. So I thought, most books fail in the market. They don't even find the publisher. So before doing that, I spent a few days less than a week, writing a prototype book called Pretotype It. I printed it in PDF, I made it available, uh, I stapled some copies myself. Soon, tens of thousands of people started to download it, translate it into a dozen languages. So I thought I was able to find a publisher that said, okay, this looks promising. So I actually went from the prototype to a prototype, which in the case of a book is a first draft, and then it finally became the product. So very one of the many examples of me practicing what I preach. With that, I think we're just right good on time, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you.